Good morning and welcome, church family. It's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Luke. And I'm Kieran. And uh, we have a few announcements for you this morning before we get started, before we jump into worship. Wherever you are right now, we are glad you're here, but we have a few quick announcements. So first things first, on Wednesday nights, we have our worship night. This is at 7 p.m. in the main sanctuary. I hope everybody's okay back there. And uh, this is always an amazing time, great time of fellowship. And uh, for everybody who's been joining, we know this is going to be an awesome night. So please see us there. Yeah, we want to see you there because Luke's going to be there for sure, right, Luke? 100%, 100%. Also, just keep in mind, we do have child care for anybody uh, between zero and four. So don't let that Bonus. stop you. We want to see you there. Also, for the men of the house, Saturday morning, 8.30 to 10 o'clock, uh, we're starting a new series. Actually, I believe we started it this past Saturday. Yeah. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. So if anybody, we got some show notes, yeah. if anybody's going through that, um, trying to get rid of the hurry and the busyness of life and trying to figure that out and navigate it, Saturday morning, 8.30 to 10 o'clock, for all the men, come on out. You will not want to miss it. And that is in the chapel. Awesome. Uh, just keep in mind, WCF is hiring a person in our maintenance department. So if you're interested or if you know of anybody that you think would be interested, check out our newsletter for more information. We would love to um, potentially hire you if that you think that's something you might be interested in. And starting this Tuesday, do we have any soccer fans tuning in from online? Any from here yeah. with us? Uh, it's Tuesday yes, night. Do. Actually, if you show up just before 8, and if you're over 18, there is going to be pickup soccer. Um, the kids are all set up with their teams, the coaches and everything. Um, but at that 8 o'clock time slot, uh, we do have some pickup soccer. So it's $2 to play. Such a deal. Come on out. Get some exercise. I'll probably last a good five minutes. And then uh, you will have to work our way up. But you got to get that cardio time. back That's up. Right. Also, fine. speaking of sports, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with pickleball, but that is happening this afternoon from 1 to 4 p.m. I don't know about you, but it's a great sport. It's kind of a mix between ping pong, tennis. So get yourself out there again. That's today from 1 to 4 in the gymnasium. Also, keep in mind this will be happening every week, Tuesday nights from 7 to 10 p.m. for six consecutive weeks. So we hope to see you there. And if you want to know more about everything that we've kind of shared with you today, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. It has it all in there. It comes out on Wednesday afternoon, evening, uh, and it just goes through everything that's going on week to week here, all the exciting new things happening. Um, awesome. You won't want to miss out. There's videos. There's everything. There's opportunities for everybody in there. So sign up for the newsletter. Head to our website or our Facebook page, and you can sign up for that newsletter. But I hope you guys enjoy worship. We're about to jump in. It's going to be fantastic as usual. So if you're tuning in online, welcome. Find a good spot to get up and praise the Lord. If you're here with us, we want to welcome you here as well. But it's going to be a great Sunday, and be blessed, church. Good morning, church family. How are we doing today, everyone? Great day to the worship the Lord, amen. So if you're tuning in online or you're here with us in person, we love you, we appreciate you today. Let's worship the King of Kings, you know, the miracle maker. Our God is alive, amen. Now search the world. But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures of fame Are never enough And then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied hearing you love sing that together oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you do you believe that this morning I'm not afraid to show you 
Please. 
comforter. He was going to send a friend. He was going to send peace. He was not leaving us alone. So no matter what you're going through today, whether you're feeling insecure about who you are, do not forget, do not forget that the Holy Spirit is with you. And just usher him into your presence. Listen for his voice every single day because he is speaking to you. He wants to do life with you. Just never forget that. He left the Holy Spirit here to live life with us. And he is here with us. So as we sing this song, we're just ushering in his presence. Ushering in his presence. Amen. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness and all that you give to us every single morning and that we get the honor and privilege to be able to bring it out into this world. So again, just we bring our hearts to you today. We bring our hearts to you. We sing to you. We acknowledge your presence and we praise your holy, your holy, holy name. You are our king. You are our father. And we sing to you today. Christian Fellowship family. My name is Louise Arsenault and this is my husband Ronnie. Today we are reading from Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift. Through the generosity of Christ, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our, to our lowly world. And, he, and the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he 
might fill the entire universe with himself. Notice that it says, he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all of the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Have a great day, Louisiana. Good morning, Windsor. Good morning, Windsor Christian Fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, children may now be dismissed for your classes. Can we all agree that that was an awesome worship set this morning, as it always is? One of the uh, songs there kind of hit me. The song called, I believe it's called Mercy. And one of the lines that I really loved is um, when they sing, "How happy we are that our freedom's not based on what we've done." I don't know if you guys can say the same, but when I'm sitting there in worship, I feel like sometimes it helps you gain a little bit of perspective before you hear the message. Um, and so for me, that's one thing that really hit me. And so I think as we, as we move throughout this, this service today, I feel like it's an interesting way we do, we do the, the, our Sunday services. And I think it's important that we do worship first because it aligns our heart. And so before I came up here, I feel like that was one thing that, that really hit me. And I feel like you know, we can be really super busy in our lives and we can, we can be going about our lives doing a bunch of different things. But when we come here on Sunday and when we are able to be here together, um, worship is, is really, really important and it helps us quiet our hearts, align our hearts for, for what God's going to be speaking through our message today um, and for how we live our, out our week. So I don't know about you, but worship is always super impactful for me. Um, and so I hope that that was able to help you listen to what God might be calling um, you to do and what God might be able to do and speaking through other people that come up here today. So uh, with that being said, it's now time for tithes and offering. As always, you guys know there's a few different ways that you can give. You can do so online on our website. Um, you can do so via e-transfer. You can do so um, on our mobile app. And then lastly, you can do so in our church foyer here. Um, as we move into tithes and offering, I just before like before we pray, I would like to read from First um, Chronicles twenty nine eleven to twelve, and it says, I think it's a good way to kind of align our hearts and have a good attitude before we we pray for the tithe. And it says, Everything in heaven and earth is yours, O Lord. Wealth and honor come from you and you alone. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. So with that in mind, let's, let's, give pray, uh, let's pray for the tithe. Thank you for the opportunity to give today, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to be able to sow into your kingdom today, Lord. Lord, that you ask us to not be generous, not only in our finances, but in every avenue of our life. That's the way that Jesus lives. So Lord, we just ask you humbly that you help us emulate the way Jesus lived generously in every way that he lived. We hope that you give us the strength to emulate that in the way we live as well. We ask that you multiply whatever we have to give today and that you use it for your will and your glory. Jesus, thank you so much for your ultimate sacrifice in giving your son. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. So last week was Easter Sunday. And uh, for those of you who were there, we know that was an incredible service. Pastor RJ and Mary both came up to um, speak, and their, their message was on the only king forever. 
and um, how Jesus deserves full lordship in every single area of our life. Um, this week, Pastor RJ will be leading us into a new sermon series titled Our Purpose, so please help me in welcoming Pastor RJ this morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are everyone doing today? I hope you had a good resurrection week. Hope you had a great time. We had fun. Okay, so today we are starting a new series for a few weeks. It's going to kind of be one of those weird ones that kind of just drags on and on and on. <laughs> because, you know, you have some special days in there. You know, we celebrate this holiday called Mother's Day and another one called Father's Day, and we want to be accountable to you in our finances, so we do some sort of a Sunday where we report on our activities, and so those are all going to be mixed in here. And uh, today's lesson on our, our purpose, I want to focus on equipping the body for the body of Christ for everyday discipleship. And this is the equipping message that we're going to do. And then next week, I don't know if you remember, a little while ago, we had um, a series called The Days of Noah. And we did like a little bit of a panel conversation teaching. So for the four weeks that the series continues, we're going to try that format with some new faces. It's going to be fun. Hopefully it's going to be fun. <laughs> and um, I just want to draw your attention back to... Uh, Ephesians 4 that Roger and Louise just read for us where it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility. What does their responsibility mean? How many have responsibilities? How many know the onus is on who when you have a responsibility? Their responsibility is to equip. Can everyone say equip? God's people to do his work. We're going to talk about what his work looks like and to build up the church, the body of Christ. I want to, I want to highlight a couple things as we go into this. The first thing that we as Christians need to know and look at and understand is this little thing called the Great Commission. Now, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Then again in Mark 16, verses 15 to 18, we see, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Does it say only to the people you like? <laughs> Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Uh-oh. Uh, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. Now, we, we see today where people totally take this and run in the wrong direction, and they pick up snakes in church. We're not going to do that anytime soon. I'm not afraid of snakes. I've held many in my day, but I am not going to be bringing poisonous snakes in to handle them to prove a point. I think you're putting God in temptations. You know, don't, don't. Silliness. Okay. Same with drinking poison, expecting not to get sick. Okay. If you accidentally ingest something, okay, there's mercy. We just sang about mercy. We need it every day. And you appeal yourself to the mercy of God. But if you drink it on purpose, not so smart. Talking about the Great Commission. Get back here, RJ. Okay. And then Luke 24, 47, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. So I need to take a step back now. When we are talking about the Great Commission, Jesus has given us instructions as Christ followers. Is there any Christ followers in the room? Yeah. Oh, there's some Christians in here. People that take on God's nature, his character, right? 
nature and character of Christ, Christians, Christianity, Christ followers. Now watch. First thing we do to become a Christ follower is we repent of our sin. If you've never repented of your sin, you're not a Christ follower, you're a Christ admirer. At best. And then he talks about this thing called baptism. Okay? And you repent, and then you get baptized. Now, the idea is, first you repent from sin, and then you make a public declaration of your faith. Everyone say public. public. So there's a reason we ask people to walk down to the front and acknowledge, yes, I want to live for Jesus. Yes, I want to be baptized in front of other people. That has to do with the public declaration. I know sometimes people sneak around the back and they say they're shy, but the truth is you're not making a public declaration. You're only half baptized. That's why we encourage you, come back next week and walk down the aisle, make the public declaration. There's a statement Jesus makes. He says, if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. Yes, that's an ouch. Okay, so we need to set our shyness and our pride aside, and we need to obey what the scriptures say. Then the declaration of faith in Jesus, symbolically, there's death that happens in our life. There's this picture of dying when you're submerged in the water, and then there's this picture of new life when you emerge from the water and you come up. We leave our old life behind in its ways and all the shame and the grief and the sorrow that get accumulated through living for ourselves instead of living for Christ. How am I doing? So one of the things that we're instructed to do in the Great Commission is to make disciples and teach them to obey all the commands of Jesus. Are we doing okay? Are we all tracking together? It's really, it's really quite clear. Teach them to obey my commands. One of his commands is repent of your sin. Another command is be baptized in water. People ask all the time, oh, is baptism going to get me into heaven? No, salvation in Christ. Christ is what gets you into heaven. Amen. But if you want to be an obedient Christ follower, you also need to be baptized in water. So, uh, Rick, Brianne, you guys are here today. Now, this is, this is what we do about once a month right now. We have a tank of water right on the other side of that wall. And we have a change of clothes and some robes. And, and, and what happens is if you've repented of your sin, or maybe you've never repented of your sin and you need to, okay, they can help you with that. Okay. And uh, you, you prayed with a guy for me last week uh, who wanted, yes, you gave your life to Christ last week. Congratulations, sir. So, so what happens is they can help you come into a relationship with the Father through Jesus and repentance. So we need to do that first. And then the next step in that process in obedience to Christ is you need to be baptized in water. And that means we make a public declaration. We walk down to the front in front of everybody. Oh, my goodness, they're going to see me. What will they think? Most of the people have done it. <laughs> They've been there, so they understand, Right? But then after the public declaration, they take you, they instruct you, you know what you're getting into. And you identify with Christ more fully because you go into the water and then you come back up as a Christ follower, fully committed, fully free. Because there's a freedom in Christ that only he can bring. Now, sometimes practically it takes us years to walk out our freedom. I guess it depends on how quick a learner we are. Right, because some of us learn real slow, and some of us the process we like going around and around. When I was in the Philippines, we said "ikot ni ikot," you go around in circles. Okay. Uh, however, uh, a couple things I want to point out here: we do not baptize infants here at Windsor Christian Fellowship, and the reason that we don't baptize infants, and and I appreciate that many of you may have been baptized as an infant, and your parents in in faith that they had and the understanding they had wanted to dedicate you to the Lord. Uh, but you can't repent when you're an infant. Usually when they get baptized, they still can't talk. I haven't seen too many at that, that age that can talk. 
Um, but repentance always precedes baptism. No repentance, you shouldn't be getting baptized. Okay, and and uh, we see scripturally there's a pretty sound um, case that I can make for that. And I'm going to suggest maybe you were baptized as a child, but you've never been baptized as a, as a professing adult who's repented of their sin. I'll encourage you. Today's your day. So everyone, just stand up for a second. See, I've got you halfway there already. I'm going to ask you, if you've never repented of your sin or you've never been baptized in water, but you know you need to, okay? You want to be obedient to Christ and his commands for your life, or maybe you need to know this Jesus who loves you so much that he was willing to die for you. I'm going to ask you to be brave and bold and make that public declaration and come out of your chair and come down to the front, and this young couple up here will be happy to serve you. Uh, I think there's some other people in the back. So they've got a team of people ready to just minister to you, to pray with you, to love on you, and they'll help you uh, either repent of your sin or get baptized in water. Is there anyone that I'm talking to here today that you're here and you need to make that level of commitment to Christ? Feel free to walk out of your chair bravely and boldly and come down to the front and God will meet you right where you're at. You take the first step, he'll meet you right there. Congratulations, sir. Is there anyone else that would like to come down? Come on down. Is there anyone else that need, you know you need to be down here? You couldn't go first, but these, these guys are down here. God's talking to your heart today. I'll just give it another second. Don't run around the back. I'm very serious about the public proclamation of your faith. You, you can't be partially obedient and expect to have full blessing. Okay, congratulations, have fun. Go ahead, you can sit, sit. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is the great commandment. So we, we, we went through the great commission. Now we're gonna go through the great commandments. There's this interesting conversation that Jesus is having in Mark chapter 12. And it seems like the religious leaders and some of the Herodians were trying to trap Jesus with these questions. Now, has anyone ever been in a conversation where someone's trying to trap you? Yeah. Entrapment. They try to catch you, right? And the first conversation is about taxes, right? And, and they're, they're kind of baiting him saying, hey, Jesus, is it legal to pay taxes to Caesar, you know? And Jesus, they, they should have figured this out by now. He saw through their motive he saw into their heart and realized what was going on. And then he answered them in a way that totally confounded them and said, show me a picture of the coin. Whose picture's on it? Caesar's. Okay. You know, the Roman ruler's picture's on the coin. Then give to Caesar what Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Amen. And he set precedent for all time that we do pay taxes to our authorities. Amen. Some of them tax people more than others. But then they go on to another, um, another conversation about the resurrection because the Sadducees didn't believe, they believed you died and that was it. So they were trying to trap Jesus with this, I'm gonna say this, foolish, fictitious situation. Have you ever got into arguments with people about those foolish, well, what if, and how many angels can stand on the end of a pin? Who cares? Good point. How does that practically apply to your life? So they get into this argument about the Old Testament law where if a man dies and he doesn't have any children, his um, brother is supposed to take his wife so that they can have a child so that his inheritance wouldn't be lost. And, and this guy goes through, you know, seven husbands die. I'm thinking she's a black widow. <laughs> oh, wait, Black Dahlia. That's the story I'm referencing right there. But, but either way... Um, you know, after seven husbands, I'm going to ask some questions. How many husbands? Is seven. How'd they, they all died. I'm going to pass. My prospects of survival are not looking good, right? But, so they're having this conversation and Jesus tells them they don't understand the word of God, the power of God, the resurrection. They don't understand. 
Okay, so he's answering all their questions. And one of the religious teachers is looking at how Jesus is masterfully handling this situation. And he throws his question out there because, of course, when someone's answering everybody's questions with so much excellence that he's just shredding them. <laughs> well, I want to know the answer to this. So in Mark 12, 28, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate, and he realized Jesus had answered well, not just well, he answered really good. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Amen. Jesus, in the masterful way that he did, he summed up the entire Old Testament law, 642 commands, the 10 commandments, in two statements, love God, love people. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Now, as I was working on this, I started meditating on something regarding Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And it's a prayer in many Jewish communities, similar to our Our Father. And, and um, you know how the Our Father is in Christian communities. There's a Jewish prayer or, or a statement. It's called the Shema. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it in a second. But to get there, I was reflecting on a couple things. And this is what most preachers would call a rabbit trail, because... We take our main content, and then we go over here and talk about something kind of related, but not really related. But I really felt to do this, so someone probably needs to hear something I need to say. And I'm going to get to influence in a little while, but when I think back to my formative years as a young man, I was, I was thinking in my time, especially when I was away at, at school, studying, uh, trying to become the best version of myself. I, I was thinking back that there's some men that influenced my life greatly. And, and I'm going to give them all a shout out here right now, and I'm going to get to the, the third one. So the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, Dr. Seif, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Seif. And he was one of those guys that wasn't very motivated. I think when I knew him, he was working on his third doctorate. <laughs> not, not too motivated. Um, brilliant man. Um, he understood the scriptures and he was able to explain uh, them on so many levels, uh, multiple languages. Anyway, the guy was incredible, but he really challenged me um, in my arrogance of youth <laughs> to become a better student. Because I might have known stuff, but I didn't know enough stuff. And then I realized I don't know nothing. He helped me with that. Okay, he did. And, and I remember one conversation I had with him. And, and I said, well, that's a Gnostic. And he shredded, he shredded me, man. He just, so how many Gnostic authors have you read this week? Um, none. Well, go back and read and then come back and talk to me. You know, He taught me to just look at all aspects of the conversation and make sure that you came to the proper conclusion. And there was an excellence in the way that he uh, exegesis of the word of God that really stuck with me and it helped me to become a better student of the scriptures. So to this day, I like to read, I like to even read things that are outside of my camp or outside of, because I wanna make sure that I'm getting the best possible perspective. And then the second man, uh, Dean Hanner, uh, Richard Hanner, he really saved my life. And I was thinking about this, I don't think I've ever really kind of gone into this in a, in a public forum, but uh, Dean Hanner, I, I was at a crossroads in my life when I was at school, and I could have I walked away from Christianity at that point in my journey. Um, you know, all kinds of people in life make errors or mistakes. They get themselves into trouble, but there's a group in Christianity that likes to throw stones at them, and there's another group that will extend a hand and say, here. And as they were singing about, let's talk about the mercy of God and let's receive that in our lives. But I was at a crossroad and I remember in one conversation, because I had had some conflict with another dean <laughs> at the school, the dean of men, and uh, at that time, and, but Dean Hanner sat me down and in one conversation, and I'm not even lying to you, 
it was like the veil got lifted and there was some download of the Holy Spirit into my life that gave me a tool that has probably kept me on the course that I'm on to this day. I think without that conversation, I probably would have took a very different path in life. And I'm not even exaggerating. I'm not embellishing. He really um, allowed the Holy Spirit to, as he would say, break into the history of my life. Right? And it set me on the course and the path that I'm on today. And uh, both of those men had a great influence in my life in that season, um, imparting some of the... And, and both of them were, they were charismatic, dynamic, and most of the students loved being in their classes because they were a little bit edgy and they were a little bit dynamic. And, and as I was thinking about this from Deuteronomy 6, God brought to my remembrance Dr. Weiss, Dr. Dwayne Weiss. And if I'm really honest, he wasn't necessarily my favorite teacher. He was the guy that was kind of just the steady, stable, consistent one. But as I was reflecting, I probably gleaned more from Dr. Weiss over my time at school than any other teacher, maybe combined. The man threw out so much wisdom for life, for ministry, for Christianity, for Christian service. And, and again, he wasn't the flashy guy, but he had so much. The wisdom of God was operating his life to such a level. So as I was reflecting on Dr. Weiss in Deuteronomy 6, I remembered something. <laughs> now, this is 25 years ago. And you, you have to forgive me, okay, because my accent is horrible. Because I, I speak English. I have a hard enough time speaking English. Okay? Hebrew is not my forte. Secondly, I'm going to suggest to you that singing is not my forte, and that will be abundantly clear to you in a moment. <laughs> However, one of the most unifying scriptures of the Old Testament, Dr. Weiss imparted to us through something called the Shema. Now, maybe one day I'll ask Steve to give you the second and the third and the fourth part of it, because I can only barely do the first. But from 25 years ago, I remember it went something like this, and then I'll explain. It was uh, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And you can see my Hebrew is horrible. However, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That single verse from Deuteronomy chapter 6 is what Jesus is quoting here when he gives us love God and love people. Amen. Right? When he's, when he's talking about these concepts in these debates and he's saying, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one and only Lord. The Shema is very important to the Hebrew people. It's important to us because we serve this one God who created us. And we're instructed by the creator, Jesus, to love God and to love others. Okay? Now, I shared that with you because I was thinking back and I was like, you know, that was something I learned 25 years ago and I can still remember just like it was today. And, and when you go through life, there is these moments where God will impart something to you that will stay with you forever. And it imprints on your heart and it shapes you and it helps you become the best version of you that God wants you to be. But you have to stay in that process. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work inside of you. Now, we're instructed to love God and to love others. Now, when I, as a church, we're a church, a local body of believers or a community of believers, and, and I want you to understand something. The church is not the four walls of this building, or one, two, three, four, five, six, six, whatever. This isn't the church. The church building is the church building, but you are the church. So we go to church, but it's really, it's a local assembly of people who want to worship God together. Okay. Ecclesia, the called out one. But, but what happens is 
you are the church and everywhere you go, you represent Jesus as his ambassador here on planet earth. Now, when we talk about the Great Commission, the Great Commandments, if that does not play a primary role in determining on how we, the church, live, um, there's going to be a problem. You doing okay? Now, the Great Commandment is about loving God. It's about your relationship with him. This determines who you are. This helps you in your identity because how you relate to God is directly linked in how you see God and how you identify with him. So as I talked about earlier with baptism, if you're not identified with Christ, you're going to have a hard time being a Christ follower. And Kyle Eidelman does a fantastic job in his series, Fan or Follower. There's a lot of Jesus fans out there. Go Jesus. Like they're cheering for their favorite team. (laughs) Go Maple Leafs. There you go. (laughs) I haven't even looked at the standings. I don't even know what they're doing. (laughs) There's a lot of people that take on the nature and the character of Christ, okay? It also has to do with loving others, your neighbor. Now, when you love your neighbor, this is what brings maturity into your life. And you know you can't mature in Christ without relationship with people. People bring out the best in you. (laughs) And also the worst. How many, everyone you know is easy to love. Nobody's standing up. (laughs) My wife, she's easy to love. My children, I see some of them over there. You're not thoroughly embarrassed, eh? I didn't do too bad singing too far. (laughs) What'd she say? I'm just going to be embarrassed because that's how it is. (laughs) Most of the time, they're easy to love. My friends, easy button. Our team here at church, easy mode. Oh, wait, that's Stephen's place. Then there's this other list. You know those people that challenge you to the very core of your existence in your love walk every single day, every moment? Does anyone have any of those people? Those people you want to pray imprecatory prayers for? I know some of you aren't familiar with the term imprecatory. It has to do with invoking evil, (laughs) cursing. You know, there's some people you want to curse, like, you know, prayers like, may your armpits be infested with the fleas of a thousand camels. (laughs) Those kind of prayers. I can't say that I've ever prayed that for someone. I've been tempted. (laughs) Thankfully, most of the rest of the humans on the planet are somewhere in between easy to love and not so easy to love. We doing okay? You know that coworker who always drops the ball and you're left having to catch it, but then one day they surprise you by finishing that report that you were thinking you were gonna spend your whole weekend working on? Or that neighbor that flings his dog waste products over your fence? The other neighbor who brings you cookies but then parks on your lawn next week? The lady at the parent association meeting that seems to have it out for you but invites you out for a girl's night and then you have a great time? The gossip's always, you know, the gossip who has nothing good to say about you, but then when you need them the most, they're the person that's there. The lovable and sweet clerk at the local winners who takes the liberty of having a long conversation with you when you're really in a hurry. I've had people want to argue doctrine with me on things like, do we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus only? They're both in the Bible. Pick one. (laughs) Baptism is what is important. The process by which we baptize people, forcibly, voluntarily. Does it have to be running water? I don't care. Pick one. Whether option A or B, get baptized. We don't baptize people in the name of Lucifer. I hope not, goodness. But I've actually sent people this verse that want to argue with me. In Amos 3.3, it says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? I walk with my wife on a regular basis, but if she wants to go that way and I want to go that way, we're not walking together. 
We can have individual walks, and I'm sure that's fine. But if we want to walk together, we have to go the same direction. So I have no problem telling you, if you want to believe that we should baptize people in the name of Jesus, great. You baptize people in the name of If you want to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, great. Either or works for me, and if that's not acceptable to you, then we're going to have to agree to disagree. I don't think that's something that's a salvation issue, the process. But if it is a salvation issue to you and you want to argue, I want to argue with you, so you may have to go worship somewhere else. I'm okay to tell people that. I don't want division. No division. Division is not allowed. We want unity in the body. And there's lots of things. There's lots of things that we have different opinions on or different views on that aren't going to separate us for eternity. And we can all come together and we can worship together. We doing okay? We can agree on so many things. Let's work on what we agree on and build on that. We can have friendly conversations on some of the other stuff, and that's okay. But let's not create division and strife because... Where there's envy and strife, there's also confusion in every evil work. We don't want that in our local body of believers. So I'm going to suggest um, you have to develop your relationship with God because no one can do that for you. Yeah. Loving him means praying and listening. You know, I was, I was, I was thinking about it. One of the things my, my wife found um, on the app version, which has multiple Bible translations in multiple languages, um, They have like a little um, verse of the day, but they started this new thing not too long ago where they have, I don't want to say random, but ministers from all over will actually take the verse of the day and they'll teach on it for a minute or two. And it's a little five minute devotion and they give you a little prayer to pray and stuff. So we've been doing that with the kids most mornings. Um, But I'm just saying there's this praying and listening. There's this obeying his commands part that we get hung up on. Because you only obey the commands you like, and the ones that challenge you in your morality, you don't want to obey those, so that can't be God. Okay? We read his word, because when we read the Bible, it helps us to know who God is and what he says about himself. We tracking okay? This helps us to align our lives with truth. Amen. Truth according to the creator. When you know who you are in Christ... It makes it easier to interact with and love others because then you don't interact with people based on your motives. You interact with people based on the love of God that he's given you. Now, people will force you to develop your character. Who are you? How do you act or react? They give you many opportunities to mature in your love walk. But constantly I am brought back to in conversations with people that I have. I have messed up along my journey and have asked God for grace and mercy and then requested other people to give me grace and mercy. So I've received it from him and others. Who am I to withhold that from people that are requesting grace and mercy? That's something we have to consider. Because Jesus freely gave you grace and mercy. It cost him his life, but he was happy to do it. We as humans sometimes, we kind of get our emotion in the way. And it doesn't mean that there's not consequence. What it means is there's at least forgiveness released and then conversation happens. Right? So I want to try to start tying this together. God has put ministry gifts in his body, the church, corporate church. Their function and role is to equip or train the saints. When the tools and instruction and concepts are communicated, the responsibility shifts to the individuals in the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. Now, the work of the ministry, the work, has many facets. There's this Greek word, diakonia. And, and it's one of those Greek words that some scholars like to debate on, and it has multiple definitions depending on the context. But in Ephesians 4 that we were talking about earlier, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you a simple definition in a second, but like service to others, ministering, promoting religion, distributing food to those who need it, even preparing and presenting food. These are all things that fall under that diaconia. So that's a simple definition. But there's many aspects of your Christian life that fall under this because when we serve God, we serve each other, we serve the community, we share food, we share time, we share money. It doesn't matter. When you vacuum the hallway or the sanctuary or sanitize the nursery or when you go cut the grass or do the weed whacking or volunteer your services as a drywall person or whether you're working with the tech team or a greeter or an usher or whether you're a musician, it doesn't really matter if you're taking care of the kids down the hall. In the church, okay, diaconia. These are ways we serve in the church, I'm going to say community. But you know, you can serve in our food bank, picking up, delivering, stocking shelves, sorting clothing, diaconia, the work of the ministry. When you share faith with others, <clears throat> when you share the message of hope, when you share your testimony of the goodness of God out in the community, outside of the church community, when you send money or goods to missions, when you pray for the sick, when you deliver the oppressed, when you stand up for what is right. Let's talk about social justice, right? And, and when you're stocking shelves, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I put that in there. <laughs> when you go to work and you stock shelves, right? But when you're helping those who need some advocacy, you're being diaconia. You're doing the work of the ministry. These are ways we serve our community. We serve our nation. We serve the nations of the earth. So whether you're in the church community or outside the church community, we should be doing the work of the ministry. And the onus is on all of us to be doing the work of the ministry constantly. But if you're not reading your Bible and you're not praying and asking the Holy Spirit to give you instructions every day, are you really a Christ follower? Ooh. Are you telling me I'm not a Christian? Look. If you live like a Christian and act like a Christian and behave like a Christian, maybe you are a Christian. But if you live like the world and don't act like a Christian, if you don't have a relationship with the Father, you might be fooling yourself, you might be fooling me, but you can't fool him. Right? That's where the rubber meets the road in this life. Lots of people play church. They even know how to raise their hands and say hallelujah at the right time. But he's going to judge us, right? He's going to judge you based on what you do with the knowledge that he's given you. He's not going to judge you based on the motive of your, or, or, you know, everyone says, oh, God knows my heart. You're right, he does. And you might not like what he thinks. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. Your heart can deceive you. That's why it says it's deceitful. It's wicked. That's why we need to bring our heart to the cross every day. That's why as Christians, we die daily. It's not about my will. It's his will. You know, I've been praying this a lot lately. God, more of you and less of me. Because, you know, you go through these seasons where you realize how much of you is involved in your life and not enough of him. So if it's more about him and less about me, isn't that how we're supposed to live? Now watch, you're a person of influence. The question is, what or who are you going to use that influence for? Will you exercise your influence for the kingdom of God or you want to build your own kingdom? Will you influence your family, friends, and neighbors towards the Christ or do you want to influence them away from him? Will you use your influence towards righteousness? or lawlessness? Will you influence the world every day or do you only influence the world on Sundays or on Easter and Christmas? How are you using the influence that God has given you? I want to read a verse from Philippians 3, 10 and 11 in the Amplified. In this, so I may know him, experientially becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in that same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers. 
the resurrection power of Christ should overflow in your life and be active in your life every day. Amen. Every moment of every day. And that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings. Wait, what? As a Christ follower, you may be a sufferer for the cause of Christ. But we have a bad theology of suffering because we were told that if we come to Jesus, all our problems will go away. That's a lie. He takes your sin. He says, in this world, you'll have tribulation. And being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did, so that I may attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. See, the power of God is active in your life. He's alive. You're alive in Christ. And if you allow the life of God to flow through you, Everywhere that you go, you can do his work. And see, we just spent a few weeks talking about the kingdom of God. The truth is, everywhere you go, you represent the kingdom. So when you lay hands on someone who's sick, you're expanding the kingdom. So we're talking about equipping today. So when you come as a local body of believers into our church services, or to our mentor groups, or to our classes, or you're tuning in on our own, We want to be giving you the tools. Has anyone ever um, been doing some sort of a project and you didn't have the correct tool? Yeah, Yeah, me too. And then you usually do something really dangerous trying to do it with the tool that wasn't designed to do what you wanted to do. (laughs) You know, when you really need a, what do they call it, a jigsaw and you pull out your (laughs) bandsaw, your skill saw. Come on, don't you cut stuff with a skill saw (laughs) as opposed to a jigsaw? (laughs) Um, You can sometimes get it done, but way less effectively. When you come together as a body of believers, our job, my job as pastor, teacher, I'm supposed to give you tools so that you're equipped so that you can do ministry. So within that, when we come together, we want to encourage you a little bit, we want to challenge you, and we want to give you a skill that's practical in your life that you can take away with you so that you could do everyday discipleship, which means you share faith with others and you bring people, you lead them into the kingdom of God so that you can continue leading them in discipleship. See, you don't have to be a theologian to be able to lead someone to Christ or disciple them. You just have to be obedient and love Jesus and get the tools. And if you have the right tools, we can show people how to do things very easily. How are we doing? Okay. So in a few minutes after communion, my friends Larry and Gene are going to come up, and at the end they're going to say, Church, you've been equipped. Be the church. Right? So when they tell you, be the church, what are they suggesting? Go do the work of the ministry. That's what the church is here to do. Because the truth is, Jesus has us here on planet Earth for that very reason that we can go take the message of hope to others. Outside of that, he would just take us home before we mess it up. Stand up with me. Let's do communion. Father, I thank you for your people this local body of believers. I thank you that your spirit is within us and you have equipped us, Lord. There's nothing impossible for you. And with you, we can do all things with your help. We can overcome our fear and our insecurity. We can cast down our anxiety. Lord, there's so many lies against the minds of your believers in this room even. I can, I, can, I can feel it. They don't know who they are and who you made them to be and how much you love them and have a good plan for them. So Father, I thank you that your word brings freedom. Your word is truth. The truth sets us free. Today, as we celebrate the covenant meal, I thank you that in your brokenness, you made a way for us to be whole. You made us a way to be healthy, and that sickness and disease have to leave in the name of Jesus. Amen.
And as we have the cup, the blood of the covenant. Father, I thank you that there's power in your blood. Forgiveness, freedom. You have set us free. Today, Lord, as we come to the table, we release forgiveness. We release mercy. Doesn't matter what's been done to us, we release mercy. And as we, as an act of our will, forgive, I thank you, Lord, that your grace is present to help us to figure out what it looks like next and what the next step is. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Help us to not be ashamed of our testimony of your grace and goodness in our life today. In Jesus' name. Well, hallelujah. Oh, how grateful I am to be with you again today. Hallelujah. God gave us this family. You know, Pastor RJ was just talking about how we are all together as saints to do his, do what God would have us to do. And I love the part about the witness of the teachers, the witness of people in your life. You know, Larry and I could honestly say each one of you have a witness to us and you may not even know it but today I just want to shout out to Jeremiah he witnessed to us in a way that I can hardly even it was profound do you know he's a strong man he walks he's strong right one day he came wheeling into church not on a Harley in a wheelchair that spoke volumes to me because he said I don't care if I have to come in a wheelchair I will be with my family I will be in the body of Christ I will be under the anointing of the worship I will be under the anointing of the word hallelujah thank you Jeremiah because as we get older sometimes we know maybe I will need to wheel in Hallelujah. Or you may have to wheel me in. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. But so, I'm coming. Thank you, thank you for the word today. Okay, Larry, I'll close with some scripture. Well, what else can we say? But in Isaiah 6, 3, it says, And one cried to another and said, Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Amen. That's you and me. Hallelujah. Then in Colossians 1, 27 and 28. Then to them God made, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Amen. That's what our job is. WCF, Windsor Christian Fellowship. You have been equipped. Go, Go. be the church. <laughs>